My name is Matthew Campbell, and before I get started, I just want to give you kind of an idea of who I am and why I've chosen this topic. Um, first of all, a lot of us talk about what's going on in the world, and we talk about what we can do to contribute to the change, but um, what we really do is talk about what we can do to contribute to someone else making the change. And that's part of our greatest challenge and part of our greatest failing. Uh, now, I'm a former journalist. Today I'm a teacher, and uh, that's kind of how I feel in the classroom sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but being a teacher, I'm exposed to a lot of the experience of experiences of teens and students and the choices they make and the lives they lead. And a, a recent experience in my life was coming out professionally. I am gay. I consider it trivial, and I don't really think of it as a big thing, but I had an experience with a student seeing him struggle with his sexual orientation and decided, I can't let him do this alone, and I can't let him think that it doesn't get better. And some of you have probably heard about the It Gets Better project. I'm one of the participants in that. And it, it's kind of what has brought me to reflect on the fact that not only do words have meaning, but we have to mean what we say with those words. Now, when you think about bully, this is probably the image you have in your mind. But this is bullying. It's not just innocent gossiping. There's no physical altercation. And those girls may not even be aware of that silent audience. But that girl is a victim of bullying. We're also seeing an increased incidence of mixed gender bullying in the classroom and actually in the community. Spousal abuse is certainly an example of bullying. Um, one that some people tend not to think about is the way parents engage their children can actually cause them to engage their peers in a way that's really not effective in conveying a message. If they want to say, you've upset me, they don't do that. If they get experienced at home with, this is what you did wrong, rather than, we need to talk, let's sit down, let's work on correcting that behavior. So we have to really think about who is in our audience at all times. Workplace bullying is something that's really been brought to focus in Nova Scotia, particularly with new legislation being passed by the government. And of course, we've seen the advent of cyberbullying, which is a really dangerous thing because you don't see the victim of cyberbullying. You only hear about it. It's more of a concept. And it's a concept that doesn't really have the impact that other more physical, more visceral bullying really does. Um, now, how many people would put this kind of sweater on their dog? It says, proud parent of a school bully. It's not something we brag about, but how often do we really talk to our children about it? How often do we talk to our coworkers about something we've seen? We even see it in the media. People are always imposing their will on others, but is it an effective imposition? Are they delivering the message in a way that's going to be meaningful? This is one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Neal, of those who say nothing, few are silent. We often look at bullying as being a situation in which there are two players. There's the bully and there's the victim. But there are the people in the sidelines who remain silent. I have actually seen news coverage of people being quoted where they say, it's just a part of growing up. Everyone's going to go through it. It builds character. You know, they'll, they'll get over it. Not everyone gets over it. Not everyone survives to tell their story. And the silent few are just as guilty as the purple, pe the purple, the people perpetrating the bullying. Because silence means complicity. And what I'm saying by that is you're contributing to the bullying situation. A person who's being bullied may be too fearful to actually report that experience. But if you witnessed it, and you say to your friends who also witnessed it, we need to go talk to the principal, or we need to go talk to the victim's parents and let them know what's going on, or I want to talk to my parents about it and see if they'll call the school about it. We have to stop trying to externalize responsibility for the way we shape our world. You contribute to charity, and then the charities take action. And it's fantastic, and it's necessary, and it's an important contribution to our world. But what are each of us doing to make things better? How are we careful about the language we use?
Let me give you another example. How many of you have said something like, I was so scared, I literally crapped my pants? Now, what did you do with those pants? You know, you know we, we really have to mean what we say and say what we mean. If we don't do that, then regardless of the one person we're talking to directly who may understand, there's always an audience that you're not aware of. Not all walls are soundproof. And not all conversations that you think are quiet are just being held within your party of people. Jock Church, who was a fellow TED presenter, made this statement in his TED talk, and I, I thought it was fantastic, and it's a sentiment I share. Life needs truth and beauty. It also needs dignity, love, and pleasure. And it's our job to hand these things out. And it's true. As long as we're sharing those things, we feel like we're contributing to the betterment of our world. But those are pretty easy things to give. Are we challenging our world? Are we challenging ourselves to make our world better? Are we challenging people in authority? Are we challenging subordinates? The challenge really comes from doing the hard things. The easy things happen with little to no effort at all. If I want to give someone love, I can just say, I love you. You look very nice today. Right away, you feel good. Now, if someone's doing something wrong and you say nothing about it, what message are you really uh, sending? I want to show you this video. Um, it came out of a classroom discussion. Do you know what this means? You might be thinking this. Or this. But how about when it's used like this, meaning that? So if you're this, meaning this, but people refer to it as that, can you ever be this? Ever? I don't think so. Now, for some of you, that message may have seemed fairly straightforward, easy to understand. Everyone knows that. But when I did that in the classroom, I actually wrote on the board, when I heard a student say that a situation that he found unpleasant was totally gay. And I just wrote gay on the board. And I stopped in the middle of a lesson to do it, and I just said, who can tell me what that means? Homosexual. What else does it mean? Happy. And then I wrote, that's so in front of it. Now what does it mean? Stupid, lame, pathetic. So even though you didn't mean anything by it, or you don't know what I mean, that's not what I was saying. Well, that's exactly what you said. How do I know that's not what you mean? Especially if I don't understand the context of the conversation in which it occurred. Have you ever said, I'm effing tired? We use profanity to, to kind of punch up a statement. But you know what word is much more effective and accurate? Very. <laughs> and if I say I'm very tired, you know I'm more than tired. But if I say I'm effing tired, what do you think made me tired? It changes the whole context of the message. And it becomes profane and kind of absurd. So we really need to think about the words we use. As Ben Johnson said, a fool may talk, but a wise man speaks. Anyone can throw a bunch of words at you. I'm doing it right now. Whether or not you're getting something from the message I'm trying to deliver determines whether or not I'm speaking to you or I'm just talking. And I guess that remains to be seen. Coretta Scott King is uh, an activist from the United States, and I love this quote. Homophobia is like racism and anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry in that it seeks to dehumanize a large group of people to deny their humanity, their dignity, and personhood. When we make foolish, ridiculous, thoughtless statements, there's every potential that we're doing that. 
Have you ever told an off-color joke? Talk about the stereotypically cheap Jew, the effeminate homosexual male, the stupid man from Poland. When you've told those jokes, how many times could you say, now before I finish this joke, are you a gay Polish Jew? Because I'm all of those things. And I never used to speak up. I just laugh it off. Well, it's a joke, and I know he doesn't mean anything by it, but every time you let that joke or that statement persist and allow it to become part of the vernacular, part of our everyday language, like, that's so gay, you're telling the world that I accept that prejudice. And I accept that even though there's victims, they're just misunderstanding me. Well, how many times can you be misunderstood before your message is really judged? Something that we tend not to realize is that gay bashing does still happen. A lot of homophobia comes in the form of cyberbullying today, but there are still very clear victims of gay bashing. These are people who are just willing to share their pictures. And this is just from last year. A teacher in the Cape Breton District School Board was assaulted just walking down Cabot Street well after midnight. And this is what happened to him. Admittedly, he was walking with his partner. They weren't holding hands. They weren't showing affection of any kind. But they had just left one of Pride Cape Breton's dances. So they left a social function where gay people congregate. I'm going to tell you a secret. It's not just gay people that go to these dances. For all those three teenagers knew, those were two heterosexual males. There was nothing about them that indicated their sexual orientation. Now, how many of you recognize this? You read lots of books about what to do. You share your ideas with everyone else, and then you go home at the end of a work day and just flop in the chair and say, sweetheart, why don't you go on the internet? What's on TV? When do you stop reading to your children? When do you stop sharing intelligent discourse with them? What happens? What, what happens that flips that switch from parent to sideline observer resenting my teenager for being mean but not really talking to them about anything? Because I see it every day. Kids come to my classroom and they are urging me to engage with them. They don't just want me to talk at them. They want to have a conversation. They want to share their ideas, and they want to learn about the world. Whether or not that world includes Shakespeare remains to be seen. So what do we do? Well, we have to be mindful of the challenges faced by our friends, peers, and children. If you're a parent, have you ever said to your child, I was young once too? Well, what does that mean? Give me specific examples. Tell me what you're talking about. Why does your experience speak to mine? Otherwise, it's just a vague statement in the back of their minds that's going to be forgotten almost as quickly as it was said. We have to remain aware that education does not begin and end in the classroom. If bullying is happening at school, it is not just up to the school or the school board or the teachers to make a difference. We as citizens, we as fellow students, we as educators, we as everyone have a responsibility to leave this world better than we found it. We say the meek shall inherit the earth, but I will be damned if I will give it up without them proving that they've earned it. We have to acknowledge that life's lessons are everywhere and are equally important. Of course, we listen. What teens say and what they don't say, this big. What happened at school today? Nothing. That never happens at school. I, s I spend my entire summer break making sure that never happens at school. I can't use the same lessons year to year. So you can't assume that the, the same thing that your teen says to you day to day is equally true. Most important, we have to love everybody. There is no room for prejudice in a world that is evolving. Change doesn't happen through inaction. Change happens through every action we make. 
And it starts with using words that have meaning. Thank you.